Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday, until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 198 for May 27th, 2015. We visit the ultimate builder, Clark W0BT. Good evening, everybody. It's Ham Nation, and it's a program all about ham radio. I'm Bob Heil. I'm here in the Ozarks tonight, and I'm joined by all kinds of really great people that enjoy this great hobby, and I'm sure that all of you do too, and if you don't, well, let's get you going. First of all, let's go see what's going on in Coast Mesa. Gordon West, how are you? Um, I'm fine. Everything is great on the West Coast, Bob. Back to you. Okay, and we're going to go down to Mississippi. How are you doing, George? George Thomas. Yeah, good evening, Bob and Gordo. Doing fine down here. It's just been kind of wet. I tell you, it's, uh, I don't know, we, we've hit the rainy season here. I wish we could send some of this Gordo's way. Well, we, we need to send it to Texas, I guess. <laughs> well, we're going to come back to you guys, and, and Don is online. Uh, he's got a lot of stuff going. Tamitha Scove is with him. Dr. Tamitha Scove, she's going to talk us about what's going on up there on the sun and how it affects all of us. <clears throat> Amanda's here and watching the chat room somewhere. But before we get all of that going, this is a very special night, and we're bringing a special person, <laughs> uh, one of our great guys that take care of all the after show nets. And if you don't join in these nets, you really should. It's almost, uh, it's imperative that you go uh, check in a net after you watch Ham Nation. Mike WT6H in the garlic capital of the world. Mike, tell us all <laughs> hey, about Michael. what is... Hey. hey, good evening, everybody from the garlic capital. And yes, it's yours truly, your 40-meter West Coast net control station, WT6H. And we're getting ready tonight. We're kicking off our 200th episode special event. Uh, we've got stations that uh, have one-by-one -one call signs that we've gotten from the FCC. And uh, basically, it, it, it all starts tonight. We're going to be running this thing for a whole week so after I get after I'm done here live on the air, uh, tune in on 40 meters. I'm going to be on or around uh, 72, 78 kilohertz. And I tell you, it's a lot more than just getting on the air and checking in tonight. There's there's six stations ranging from W zero H W one W five H W six H W seven H and W nine H. And I think I said W one H there too. So. You want to try to work four of the six special event stations. You'll have a week to do it. We'll be on like in the evenings after work, uh, on the weekdays, and then on the weekend, uh, like Friday night and Saturday night, we'll be on the air uh, pretty much the whole day. And uh, look, listen for the call signs out there. Now, here's, here's the bonus thing, and there was a twist going on with this. We didn't want to let the cat out of the bag, but I know at Dayton it got out. And uh, hey, we've got the show host, so we're going to have uh, Dr. Bob's going to be joining us in this event, Gordo, George, uh, Amanda, Valerie, uh, Christian, uh, hopefully Don has something left there of, of his radios that, to join us there. And uh, boy, did I forget anybody there? Oh, Randy, K7AGE, will be using his 10-meter uh, homebrew dipole that we saw him make a few weeks ago. And uh, if you work one of the show hosts, that will count as a wild card. So to get the four stations you need to earn a certificate, um, you need to work at least three of the one-by-ones, and then you could work one of, of the show hosts. So you, now, the show hosts are only going to count for one 
Um, so you can only work one, basically one uh, show host, one wild card credit. Um, ho hopefully you'll be able to work all of the show hosts and work all of the one by one stations. Now, if you work all six of the one by ones, you will earn a special endorsement for a clean sweep. And that's what you want to do. So six stations out there, earn the clean sweep. Uh, I've just put up a, a 75 meter dipole. So I will be on the air anywhere in between 10 meters to 75 meters. And remember, this is only an HF event. So we won't be on uh, VHF, UHF, six meters. We will not be on there. Um, but we'll try to get on 10 meters for the technicians down in the, the 28.3 to 28.5 uh, uh, megahertz range there. And, uh, yeah, come on, come on and say hello. Tell your friends and uh, let them know tonight we're going to be on. It's going to be me and Dale. And Al's got a lot of lightning there. So we all know what happens when you mess with lightning. You don't want to do it. So he's got his radios unplugged, but should be on by uh, about it, maybe an hour or so after the show's over. And we're going to try to do like a round robin, like a tag team thing and pass it around. So you may be able to earn your certificate here tonight just on 40 meters. Um, we're going to have the three, uh, three, three regulars here, me, a K1LTJ, and uh, K0HYD. That's Dale. We'll be using W6H, W0H, and W1H. And we're going to kind of pass it around. And then we've got Steve. Uh, W7H, and he's going to be on 20 meters there. Now, uh, K5LN, that's Bill, he's W5H. He will not be on the air until uh, Friday, Saturday at the soonest. Um, and he's he's traveling right now, so you'll have to be patient for him. But I promise you, he will be on the air during the event. And, uh, boy, I don't know if I've, I've covered everything there. We do have a web page that you can go to. In fact, just go to any of the QRZ um, pages there on any of the call signs that I mentioned there, and it'll give you a link. Uh, it'll be an online certificate. You'll be able to print it out, and uh, with your call sign after the event is over. Um, boy, I, I don't know what else. This is going to be a whole lot of fun, and we're celebrating. It's our bicentennial broadcast, 200 episodes of Ham Nation uh, in, in a couple weeks here. And uh, it's just so, so wonderful with this show and, and it, the popularity that it's gained. And uh, we're going to make some noise on the air definitely here tonight. Uh, so, uh, Bob, what, what do you got to say to that? Are you, are you going to be joining us uh, uh, tonight on the air? Yeah, well, I'll probably be on 40 meters tonight. And I okay. wanted to tell you, uh, first of all, June the 10th is our 200th broadcast. It, it's okay. just amazing that that we have been all of these years and, and here we are with the 200th show. And all I'm going to tell you, it's all I really want to tell you. No, I want to tell you more, but we're going to have a very, very special guest on June the 10th. So you be sure and uh, be here for that great show, the 200th. And uh, we appreciate all that you do. Uh, Mike and all of the after show hosts, because I tell you, to me, that really has built this this show, keeping it going afterwards. Uh, and uh, we started off with with Cheryl and Bill and, and and then yourself. And then it just kept growing. <laughs> Al, and I'll forget somebody, but all of you guys and gals have really kept it get it going and we appreciate that so thanks for coming on and uh, really quickly tonight uh, mike but we wanted you uh to tell uh, everybody what's going on i guess the best best thing to do is to go to w6h uh the website and everything is there is that not right mike absolutely uh, well you want to go to qrz and then hit the w6h in the lookup on there and then it'll give you all of the information for the event so the event is going to run through a week from today, and then it'll end at midnight local time. Now, I'm not making this up. This is the way that the ARRL, the FCC, they coordinate your special event call sign is uh, valid for it on that calendar day. So it will end. It will start um, on the, the East Coast. Um, so W1H will go off the air first, and then it'll follow up with the uh, through the central part of the states and then over to the west coast where me and Steve uh, will be on the very last stations that will be going uh, off the air. And so you'll, you'll have a whole week. So no hurry to get if you're If you're watching the show on the replay um, and, and it's between May 27th and June 3rd on your calendar um, before next week's show, uh, the end of next week's show, you will be able to work us. And um, yeah, tell, tell your friends. 
Uh, Bob, thanks for having me on the show. And I've got to go get my, my tubes warmed up here and my, and my uh, other microphone plugged in. <laughs> yeah, I've got some contacts to put in the log here tonight. You guys have a great show. Okay. <laughs> Look well, at my thank hair. you. Oh, boy. For being... <laughs> <laughs> thanks for being there and giving us all the information. And Gordo, you're going to be all fired up and ready to go after your meeting tonight. So maybe we'll catch you. I don't know if I'll catch you on 10 meters, but I bet you I get WB6 NOA someplace. What do you think? Um, yes, I will be there. It will be rather late in that I've got a two-hour emergency group meeting. And Bob, speaking of emergency groups, this Saturday, WX4 NHC, WX like Weather 4, National Hurricane Center, will be on the air all day Saturday. They'll be on 14.325 as well as other bands, as well as on Echo Link and uh, all over the place. So we hope all of you have a chance to work WX4 NHC and maybe score one of their cool QSL cards this coming uh, Saturday. And look at this, Bob. <clears throat> Latest issue of CQ, and uh, CQ is out there and going strong. And, Bob, look at this. This comes from Maine Trading Company. I got this at Dayton, 45 bucks. It's a frequency counter that also reads out tone. And by pushing a button, it'll also send that back to your radio to make sure that you've got your radio with CTCSS decode properly decoding. So if you're looking for an inexpensive counter, uh, Maine Trading Company is where this one came from at Dayton uh, Hambenchen. And it's cool. It's a near field counter. It won't count anybody 100 yards away, but get within about three to five feet of the transmitter and this will faithfully read out the frequency. Back to you, Bob. Okay. Well, that, uh, that really uh, that really lays it out there for some of the uh, guys needing a frequency counter. That looks like a cool deal. I have not seen that. Uh, I did get to see uh, Rich and, and, and the guy, gals from uh, Maine Trading at Dayton. That was the first year there, so uh, it was good to see them. Well, I... Uh, I know that you've got some some short uh, pictures and slides, as we call Gordo's short shots. So let's go do those right now before we head off to uh, George and ICOM America. So go ahead, Gordo. It's all yours. All right. And joining me over my shoulder is the Amateur Television Network, also big at Dayton, Ohio. And they're on the air streaming us as well. So thanks, Don, and all the amateur television uh, viewers that are watching. Well, let's see what's happening a month from now. Anybody know what's happening a month from now? Brian, let's go ahead and roll it. That's right. It's field day. And we encourage all of you in planning for field day, get that banner up and make sure that you're in an area where everybody can spot you and you can tell them all about ham radio. Double check that you've got your site map all calculated out. And most important, make sure that you've got a greeter. So when those folks go on, what the heck are you doing with all this aluminum in the air and wires? You can tell them all about what ham radio does in an emergency in their area. So get that site map out and start to put up those antennas. Try and separate them as much as possible. And what a lot of folks do is they have the antennas well separated, but they bring all the coaxes into a central operating position and these are handy although this one is no longer manufactured there are many other great manufacturers of band pass filters so if you're on 40 you're not going to get clobbered by somebody on uh, 75 or 20 meters at least we hope not time now you got uh, three and a half weeks to start actually four weeks to start sorting out the coax cable and deciding uh, uh, what you're going to do for field day but start tonight, well, maybe tomorrow, and get ready and have your plans to be able to collapse that antenna <clears throat> or your microwave, get it in your dune buggy. Look at Mike on the right-hand side. He's going, oh, my God, we got to get this thing in the air. Yes, uh, we, we will. <clears throat> be careful, be safe, and have a safety officer there to make sure that everybody is safe and putting up that uh, big beam antenna <clears throat> or whatever antennas you have. Make sure everything is well marked. 
This is the radio waves. They were at Dayton Ham Mention, off center fed. Sort of a cool antenna. It works on multiple bands, but you may not want that. You may want to do a double bazooka that resonates only on one band and rejects the others quite nicely. So have that all planned out. And get those antennas up on the air. We'll be operating a lot of microwave at the field day I'm going to. And there's six meters. We got it on the back of the van with a microwave down there on the uh, van's bumper. <clears throat> so play field day. Even if you just want to play field day as an individual operator, get those antennas out there, a nice spot to set up and have fun. <clears throat> those are those little portable dipoles. Watch out for wind because it will change your polarization from horizontal to vertical, as uh, Chip found out up in the uh, high mountains of, uh, I think it was Montana, <clears throat> just a little wind the night before, although he was still on the air. Microwave, if you're doing microwave work, as uh, we will be doing, a lot of activity on 10 gigahertz during field day. <clears throat> and remind folks, don't stand in front of the antenna. Well, he did move a little bit, but the San Bernardino Microwave Society always has a great time, and they're going to have a microwave uh, test uh, in just a couple more weeks. Make sure everything is working as it should. And for those of you with a Cushcraft A3 or A4, take off that black little rubber uh, gasket uh, if your trap is loose and tighten up this one screw that is a real booger to get everybody in trouble when it's loose. Tighten it up and your trap will now work like it uh, should. Have a field day log, not just to the context, but logging who's at what station, what's happening and how it's going up. It'll be fun to look it over at the end of the field day activity. Field day, you know, is that last weekend in June. And think about food. Look at Tracy and Jody off to the uh, left-hand side. They're going, more food. Very important that everybody is well-fed <clears throat> at a uh, field day in Camden. Think about what you're going to do to get more kids involved in field day. And you know the rules have changed now, allowing for uh, small little radios like this to count as well, maybe even going through... Uh, distant stations and there's clint bradford who's showing off how to work the international space station as well as satellite passes that's always a big draw for kids so start planning now <clears throat> plan your techniques plan what bands you're going to be on how you're going to operate digital as in the case of icom's wonderful d star system and get set for field day right around the corner have a solar panel or two or a solar panel, or three, or four extra points when you're operating solar. Uh, if this does a half an amp, I'll be surprised, but you never know. Maybe in a stiff wind, it could do more than one amp. So field day is fun. Whether you do like Chip and I do a couple of years ago down at the beach when the fog was in, believe me, people came by going, what are you doing? And we explained all about field day. And exotic antennas on a small little uh, RV, absolutely. And there's a solar panel. So plan to do field day. Now, this will be the new enclosure I'm going to be testing out shortly. I brought it in from the Dayton Hamvention, and it's going to be really slick once I add the little string of light-emitting diodes. And very important, certainly a good headset. Here's the Heil headset for field day. But also tag on to your audio out live audio because when guests come in and look over your shoulder they want to see more and want to hear more than just your moving mouth so have audio coming out as well as out of that headset so folks looking in on field they will have a good idea and plan strategy as to who's going to be on what bands we'll have the 9100 out there and it's going to get a workout ray at field day down here along the west coast so headsets are good to have that band chart ready. <clears throat> By the way, you can also operate as a group with single operators with their own equipment, and that way you don't have to worry about doubles. Nothing worse when someone says doubles. And be prepared for rain. And <laughs> look at this operator. Nothing slows him down other than me yelling at him, get out of the rain. He's having a great time. Field day at its best. There's Chip K7JA, and uh, Chip is uh, doing electronic logging. Make sure all your field day ops 
are familiar with the type of logging that you're going to need. Fly your flag. And Bob, look at that. It's got the Heil flag down there because you were on scene for this field day. Of course, the American Radio Relay League. Check out the field day rules and some of the new rules that allow us to do more. And, of course, old glory at the top. So field day is a fun day for amateur radio operators. Play it up big. Have it all big. together. Where have it all, all together, together where your antennas on the outside. And have fun at field day so that's field day about a month away and we'll give you more info on some of the plans we're making at this end and next week as well as this week will be on 10 meters 28 400 as one of the contacts for our bicentennial celebration that's field day that's radio bob i'll see everybody june 12 and 13 in irving texas for hamcom back to you bob Okay, very good. Well, while we're talking about field day, remember uh, we talked about this a couple of year ago, years ago when I got to go, and they're going to do it again. They're having – if you guys – and if you don't get electric radio, come on. You have to do this. This is one of the best – amateur radio magazines that I ever have received. It's really great. Look up electric radio uh, online, order this thing. And uh, here is a full page about what is going to happen on field day in Jonesboro, uh, Tennessee. That's wow. the home of Wes Shum. Who is Wes Shum? You owe him a lot because he's the guy that brought single sideband to amateur radio. And he will be there operating his own equipment. And that is really cool. Uh, he's, uh, I think he's 91 now. Very good shape. You'll get to meet. When you, when you talk about a legend, that is a legend. And uh, go to this website. Uh, <laughs> this is crazy. I didn't have time to tell you about this, Brian. But here it is. CE, that stands for Central Electronics. CE-multiphase.com. Look that up. Go in there and get you a room uh, somewhere there in the town if you want to. Or bring your tent and spend all weekend in his wonderful, wonderful place. And there's, uh, there's the great line of equipment that he built. And Nick Tusa keeps it all going. Nick's going to be on the show in a few weeks. But I wanted to let you know, for all you guys that want to go and spend a terrific field day, that's it right there. Uh, it's just so wonderful to be around these legends, let me tell you. These, these are the guys that made it happen. And uh, we'll have more about that. But I'll be there, and I, I just can't tell you what a thrill it is for me to be with, with Wes Shum for, and all the guys for a couple of days. Um, I, I, uh, I guess we should go down to soggy, wet uh, Mississippi. <laughs> and we're going to learn about the great icon, but I think we got some other things going on. What do you got, George? What's happening? Well, I've got the uh, monthly icon contest I'm going to talk about in just a moment, but first let's take a look at this message. Out from the shack and into the sun, brighten your day with icon selection of handhelds, mobiles, and HF rigs. Step outside with ICOM's ID51A Plus Digital Dual Bander. Features include free downloadable RSMS1A Android app, near me repeater function for D-Star as well as analog repeaters, and integrated GPS. Hit the road with ICOM's analog IC2730A mobile or the digital ID5100A with internal GPS. Both radios include optional Bluetooth capability for hands-free operation, 50 watts output power on both VHF and UHF, and a large backlit screen for high-contrast viewing. Get mobile with ICOM's IC7100 D-Star radio, which provides multiband and all-mode communications, and an angled control head and touchscreen for user-friendly operation. For solid HF operation this season, try ICOM's IC7600. This rig offers advanced DSP technology and three IF roofing filters, dual watch on the same band, and LED backlighting on an ultra-wide 5.8-inch display. 
Let ICOM brighten your day with their selection of handhelds, mobiles, and HF rigs. Make sure you visit ICOMAmerica.com slash amateur today for more information on ICOM's complete line of amateur radio products. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to ICOMAmerica.com slash Ham Nation. Throw your name in the hat for some great swag prizes like T-shirts and hats. And you'll also learn how you can win the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. And for me, the grand prize is going to be the ID5100A dual band, dual watch mobile with touchscreen, D-Star, GPS receiver, automatic repeater lift-up function, and a lot more. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation for all the official rules and to check out the previous drawing winners. And, hey, you got, I guess this will be the last chance for this month that you might win that radio. So go after the show this evening, throw your name in the hat, sign up, good luck, and don't forget to follow Icom America Incorporated on Facebook and Twitter. And now, Bob, I think you've got some uh, special short shots for us, don't you? I have a very special thing going to happen. I, I, you guys and gals all know I love to build. It's it's just been wonderful for me uh, over my career of amateur radio, starting in 1956. But last summer, I met a guy that puts everybody to shame about building equipment. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't do what he does, but we're going to meet W0BT, Clark Hatch. He, he's an amazing guy. So we're going to run through these pretty fast, and uh, you're going to see why I was <clears throat> so infatuated with the visit and why I love talking to him on 75-meter uh, AM in the morning. So let's get set to go, uh, Brian, we'll run through these pretty quick. There he is in Shawnee County, Kansas, uh, near Topeka. He's, uh, he's got a lot going on. Clark Hatch, here we go. He, uh, he, he builds everything. And guess what? He still does paper logs, as I do. <laughs> but uh, that's what we do when we're old. A bunch of us from the uh, Mocan group went down to visit him. That's Daryl and uh, Bill. And that's uh, uh, Clark standing there uh, looking so proud. This is why he looks so proud. Look at all of this stuff. This is oh, just wow. wow. And you'll notice that most everything you see is, is home built. Uh, you'll see a few receivers. But uh, everything here, uh, he's, he's built from scratch, designed it all. That's a 390 receiver. He, he loved 390s. You're going to see in a minute more of them. <laughs> he loves to collect things, too. Um, and, hey, why not have... Uh, uh, one of the great little uh, uh, radios that we all started with, a little regen receiver. Uh, we all had to do that years ago. And you should be doing that now, too. Here's a one-tube transmitter. This was very popular in the 50s. It was a novice transmitter. Two tubes, a rectifier and a final. Crystal controlled. Uh, he didn't buy the AT1. He built his AT1. <laughs> it started from scratch. <laughs> he even built his own chassis. And... Uh, uh, there's a typical setup uh, uh, with the Halocrafters HT32 and uh, so on, but the receiver is one of the receivers he built decades ago. Now, see, not everybody builds a receiver. That's a toughie, but he builds lots of them. That was one of the first. And, of course, everybody has to have a Collin somewhere in your collections, I guess. But uh, uh, true to form of uh, Clark, uh, he has a lot of oh, columns. Oh, oh. <laughs> and when he, when he uh, goes out and uh, collects things, he really uh, makes it happen. And there's just oh. all kinds of great stuff. Now, he loves R390s. And if you're having trouble finding one, this might be it. Because he collects them and restores them to the nth degree. Everything here works and they're working perfectly and he just collects all that stuff but guess what he's got a good old mosley cm1 and uh, uh, if to go along with the mosley cm1 you had to have a mosley generator now this is very special when john clemens went to design his cm1 receiver he needed a generator and in those days there wasn't a good generator so he built his own and it's one of the best 
to, uh, generator, frequency generators there are today and still is. Clark will tell you that, and you see what he did. He goes out and collects them all, but he uses them every day. So why not have the best? John Clemens frequency counters and his generators, all of that. That's one of the first receivers that Clark did. And it, it's just uh, gorgeous to see this stuff. you got to remember, some of this was built years ago. Another receiver, now check that out. Uh, it's all digital. And the, the, everything about what he does, he's got DSP filtering. Nope, it's all crystal filtering. <laughs> but it's done right. Uh, boy, if we could buy that stuff today. Then we get into this. This is a transceiver with an 813. It's an AM transceiver. This fabulous stuff. He uh, he comes up with these great ideas. This was, I just thought, the cutest thing. It's a little uh, amplifier. Of course, none of his stuff little <laughs> puts out a kilowatt or more. But isn't it clean looking? Again, uh, you'll see down the line here in a minute. He does everything. He makes the chassis, all of the, the pieces and parts. Uh, he makes it all. There's another transmitter with uh, a Halicrafter receiver, and I like the sign. My wife says if I don't give up ham radio, she's going to leave me. Lord, I'm going to miss her. <laughs> oh, golly. And we had so much fun at this place. And here is another. Uh, now, this, this goes back probably 30, 40 years with him, but he still has all these old pieces, and they work, and they work really well. Uh, this is a, a wonderful little uh, transceiver that that I saw, and he uh, he does mostly RTTY with this transmitter. I uh, I thought that was really cool because it was small, but again, he made every piece, the chassis, everything. There's that uh, transmitter again uh, sitting in another. Yeah, I think he had two or three of the same one, and it it just looks so good. Here's another one. This is a roller inductor pair uh, pair of three five hundreds, I think, in here. But uh, I'm just amazed at his metal work. Uh, he uses old uh, highway signs. He used to work for the highway department, and they'd toss out highway signs. He'd take them and strip them down and use them. Now, here comes the goodie. <clears throat> Trivial station, okay? Uh, he has an HC32 Halicrafters and a transmitter and the Halicrafter receiver. But what you see to the left of him is his final. Now, most of us have finals, and they're band-switching finals, a pair of tubes or one tube. These are individual amplifiers on, on all the frequencies of 75, 40, 20, 15, and 10. They're all individual amplifiers, and all he does is switch the inputs and outputs. They stay tuned on each band how cool is that? Well, that was done in 1963. That was the major article in the 1963 ARRL handbook, how to build that particular transmitter. And it's not one, it's five. And he built one for each band. Isn't that cool? And if, the, if you look real close, you can see the input uh, coils up there. They're, they're smaller and then bigger and bigger and bigger as they get to the bottom with the... Uh, uh, with the 75 meters. Uh, it's, it's just cool. I, I really enjoyed seeing that piece of gear. That uh, was cool. And I don't know how long it took him to build, but it would have been longer than a day. Okay, here's how it all starts. He was building an amplifier <clears throat> and starting, and this is how he does. It lays out his front panel. Notice up in the left corner, you can see one of the street signs before he, he uh, uh, took the paint off of it. But uh, he makes all the panels from that wonderful aluminum and gets it all set up to cut out the parts, pieces, meters, knobs, controls. And uh, this is the chassis of another transmitter, but you see he's got everything there. All the coils, all the tube sockets, just cool. This, he was working on it on the final for that front plate you saw a minute ago. <clears throat> and uh, I, uh, I talked to Clark uh, yesterday, and by golly, he's got it working. So we'll have to 
getting him back on the air and see. There's another one of, that was beautiful, beautiful construction. It looks like it was built in a plant somewhere. It was. It was built in, <laughs> in the W0BT plant. Beautiful construction. And, of course, wow. design. You have to be able to design all these things. And uh, this is underneath one of the uh, transmitters. <clears throat> and he just does such beautiful work. You're so, so to be commended. Now, we've been talking about all this stuff. You figured, well, you know, Clark, all he does is sit around on a... Oh, no, 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 no. This is a soft rock. Hey, George, check it out. He's one of these guys that says... Well, while I got the brake a bending and I'm lettering all these boxes, I might as well build, well, how many? Seven of them, I think. Was. <laughs> he just builds a bunch of them. And I, I, I just marvel at the fact that he, uh, now he's on AM every morning with us with his gorgeous sounding AM signal, and it's from a soft rock. So he's up to date. Very much up to date. And I admire him so much. He's such a talent and a, he's a national treasure to amateur radio. So I appreciate uh, being able to show you these and taking the time tonight. But I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, send him an email. Tell him you enjoyed it. W0BT. Get on the air on uh, 3885 in the mornings on AM. Join us because you will find a lot of great guys on the uh, on the Mocan boot. It's really great. Missouri, Kansas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, all kinds of guys on there. But we're on AM. Still the old stuff, but boy, oh boy, new radios work just as well. So thanks a lot for uh, the time there. I, I, I hope that you did enjoy it. So we're going to go down here now and we're going to talk to another builder, a couple of builders that know how to do this also. George, take her away. Keep the solder flowing. Well, I think after the show tonight, I probably won't be on the net. I'm going to be collecting some materials to build chassis with now that I know where you get it. But, uh, <laughs> boy, I mean, what a great collection, Bob. Most of that stuff looked like it was store-bought. Very little of it yeah. looked home-built. And to go all the way from a one-tube transmitter, well, actually two if you count the rectifier, up to a soft rock where you're doing surface mount work, I mean, uh, boy, he is current. Because, you know, most guys uh, who built stuff a long time ago started out with tubes, just like tube stuff and stay with that. But, boy, I noticed digital displays and everything else all the way up to software-defined radios there. He is really on top of things. Yeah, he boy, always I, has I, been. Yeah, and hey George, does this mean if we come down to Jackson and and, and all the stop signs are gone, we know where to find them? <laughs> yes, that means anytime you come to an intersection, slow down and look first. <laughs> uh, boy, uh, yeah. but what what neat chassis there! I mean, they did look just like they were made in a factory, and and his lettering was all impeccable as well. Some of that stuff I thought was Collins gear, and then you said. No, he built this. Boy, no. I mean, <laughs> what What can, I mean, gee whiz. I, I don't even know what to say about that, Bob. I'm just, just taken way back. <laughs> so I'm going to have to sit back here and contemplate that while we watch a video here from Randy. You know, several weeks ago, he uh, started building that 10-meter dipole. And this week, he got around to tuning it. So let's take a look at that. Hello, Randy K7AGE. This is my second video on the 10 meter dipole. In this video, I'll show you how to check it out using the MFJ259. Uh, I have a 269 antenna analyzer. So I'm not going to show you all the details about putting the antenna up. I've uh, marked with some tape on the wire at the 8 foot 3 inch area, which is where we calculated to be the correct length for the antenna. You can just pass the wire through the insulator and wrap the wire back around on itself. So no sense cutting it. Remember, we made it long and uh, no, no cutting, no soldering. Just wrap it back around on itself. I like to use this braided survey line. It's, uh, it's not twisted, so it doesn't twist apart. And the bright colors are useful, especially if you're at a temporary location or like field day, to let people know that there's a line up in the air. So that's what I'm going to be using today is this uh, purple surveyor's line. So I installed my antenna into a couple trees near the house. 
and I just threw the line up with the nut and pulled the antenna up, attach it with the coax, and with the uh, 10 meter antenna, you don't have to be super high. 17 feet up in the air is a half wavelength, so that'll do good. And also you want to be careful that you're not putting up the antenna near any power lines for safety or near your house with gutters or anything that may interact. So having it out in the clear up 17 feet should work well for you. Okay, I have my MFJ antenna analyzer connected to the dipole and uh, let's turn it on and see where it's resonant. Okay, I have the meter running and our target frequency for the antenna was 28.3, but look at the SWR is 2.6, 2.5. So we're way off. So where is the antenna resonant? I go up in frequency, it's worse. If I go down in frequency, watch the meter here dip. Right there. So at 26.6 is where we're resonant. So it's low in frequency means the antenna is long, and we have to shorten the antenna. Now let's figure out how much. So let's review our original work. The target frequency was 28.3, and when we divided by 468, the overall length needed to be 16 and a half feet. Divided by two is basically eight and a quarter feet, which is eight feet three inches, or a total of 99 inches. And the way we can figure out the new length is take the current resonant frequency, divide it by the target frequency, multiply it times the length. So if we do that, we take the new frequency, the current resonant frequency of 26.6, divide it by 28.3 times 99 inches, makes the new length 93 inches, or subtract 6 inches from each end. So now we're going to shorten up the dipole. Okay, so what I'm going to do is unwrap the wire from around itself and I'm just going to hold my finger there and I'm going to shorten it up by six inches. So six inches is here so I'm going to pull that in and bend and now that's where I'm going to wrap it around itself. And I do this on both ends of the dipole. So now we have the antenna shortened up and reconnected, and you can see the SWR at 26.6 has gone up quite a bit. If I turn the frequency up and look for a dip, it's right there at 27.9, let's call it 28, which is the bottom of the technician band, bottom of the 10 meter band, up at 28.3. We were, um, it's about 1.3. Uh, 1.5 depending on which meter you read and that's good enough the radios will work fine into that that SWR up at 28.5 the upper end of the technician band it's 1.4 uh, maybe about 1.6 so somewhere around 1.5 and your radio will work fine so the antenna is still resonant just a little bit low in frequency I mean, which means it's slightly long and if you went back and readjusted it probably by about an inch on each end. It would probably bring it more into the resonant right within the technician area. But it's good enough. It'll work. Now let's take a look at it with an SWR meter and a radio. I have my FT817 transceiver connected up to this old swan, this SWR-3 meter. This is probably 40 or 50 years old. Um, maybe uh, there may be some CB meters that look basically the same thing. It has two coax connectors. One is labeled the transmitter, so this cable goes to the back of the radio, and this other cable here goes off to the antenna. So the way you use one of these is that you put it into the forward or the calibrate position and transmit. I have the radio set for packet mode because that'll put out a, a full five watt signal. And when you key up the transmitter, you adjust the calibration pot, and this is kind of dirty. So you adjust that for, for basically full scale. Then you let go, and you go over to reflective, and I key up, and I'm seeing about 1.2. The meter in the radio switches to SWR and transmit, and that's not even showing a, a indication. So that's at 28.3. And I'll take it down to say 28.2, just inside the band. 
and go to forward and recheck my full scale. It's, it's okay. And there it's, uh, it's less than 1.1. And let's go up to 28.5 and we'll check it again. Go to forward. Looks good. Go to reverse. And there it's about 1.3. I'm still not seeing any indication on the radio. So the radio is, is happy. Um, this is where an antenna analyzer becomes real handy because you can check the resonance outside of the amateur band, which you can't do with a radio. Well, that wraps it up for this video. I showed you how easy it is to build a 10 meter dipole with the previous video. I showed you here how to check it out and tune it up using the MFJ analyzer. If you don't have an analyzer, you may want to consider buying one because it's a very useful piece of test gear to add to your ham radio toolkit also showed you how to use a little simple SWR meter to check out the antenna as well. So that's it. Um, build yourself an antenna and get on the air. You technicians have, can have a lot of fun on 10 meters. This is Randy, K7AGE. Thanks for watching, 73. CQ, 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 CQ 10 meters, CQ, CQ, CQ from Kilo 7, Alpha Golf Echo, K7 AGE, Randy in Grass Valley, California, calling CQ and standing by. Well, throwing up wire in a tree is always a lot of fun. Uh, thanks for that, Randy. Well, you know, we didn't give away anything the last couple of weeks, so I think we will give away something special this week. As a matter of fact, it's going to be this microphone that I'm talking on right here. This is a Heil HMM. It's a hand mic that uh, Bob recently designed and developed that sounds a little different than most of the others that you're going to find out there. And if you want to win this, well, I've got a question for you, and you're going to have to do just a little bit of homework on this one. Not much, though. You know, the frequency response on a, a typical dynamic hand mic is... Only about 150 hertz to 4 kilohertz. Well, what do you think the frequency response is on this Howl HMM? If you think you know the answer to that, well, send your answer to me, hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you could win this. As a matter of fact, I'm going to sweeten the pot a little bit. We'll even throw in this nice Howl, if I can get my finger off the logo, cap. It's one of those... Uh, Fits any size, adjustable ones. Well, automatically adjust. So, the microphone and the hat, but I know you probably want the microphone the most. So, uh, what's the frequency response of it? The Howl HMM. Send it to me, hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you could win. And now, let's bring in Don Wilbanks here and get a message from another one of our sponsors. Well, I'm sitting here reading the dx engineering catalog and there's a really good reason a well you know they're uh, they're our sponsor tonight and b i've got some shopping to do and i think since my antenna got hit i'm probably going to have to replace a bunch of coax and I, I have a whole bunch of coax in the garage but what i don't have are the connectors and so you want to go and check this out now in addition to a lot of brand new products at dayton if you weren't able to make dayton here are some of the latest innov innovations they had this there the the new DX Engineering PL259 connector. It's a better mousetrap solution to old connector issues. This thing is, is a really slick looking PL259 plug. It's patent pending. Next generation PL259 design features the best qualities of both crimp on and solder connectors. Uh, these features make it ideal for single or double shielded coaxial cable. It's a silver plated center pin, has a deep scallop that gives you. Excellent solder flow inside the center conductor, and that's what you want to do. You want to fill that thing with solder, make a nice uh, electrical as well as a mechanical connection. And the connector's enhanced crimp shield gives you 360 degrees of electromechanical continuity. Very important. you got to have both electrical and mechanical continuity, and this PL259 will do that for you. The overall design of the connector will prevent arcing within the SO239 and also ensures a low-loss connection. It's available in packs of 6, 12, or 24, for all of your uh, cable projects, and also if you want to do the the uh, pre-made DX Engineering cable assemblies, you can get those as well. I've got one in my hand, and it is a really, really nice, nice setup. And if you're trying to securely mount a cross member to a tower face, you got to check out the DX Engineering Genius Clamps. They're an excellent option, and not only attaching things to towers, they have 
hundreds of other uses too. Any place you need to accommodate a one or two inch outside diameter tubing clamped at right angles, these will do it for you. They're made from stainless steel for excellent weather resistance. And also, uh, the highly regarded series of coaxial cable stripping tools, uh, they have a new model now at DX Engineering. They're specifically made to install solder type PL259 connectors on the 50 ohm coax. They work on solid or foam dielectric, either PVC or PE jackets. The newest model is precisely made for RG213 and RG8. They have two other versions that are still available as well uh, for the larger cables like 213 and, and, uh, and 8, and then the smaller cables like Mini 8, the 8X. They uh, will give you a clean, precise cut time after time. And uh, you should have gotten the new DX Engineering Spring-Summer 2015 catalog by now. If you haven't, go to dxengineering.com, sign up, get yours free. It's chock full of brand new gear, uh, including something that, I think is important, uh, to me anyway, grounding and lightning protection. Polyphaser is a really good brand. Uh, they carry that. They carry the Alpha Delta. They carry all kinds of good stuff to uh, ground and, uh, and protect yourself from lightning. And I saw on Facebook today that somebody else got hit by lightning, so another ham on his antenna. So it's important stuff. DX Engineering ships faster than anyone else in the industry. If you get your order in by 10 p.m. Eastern and if it's in stock, it'll be on a truck headed your way tonight. Proven Products, expert advice, DX Engineering helps you shrink the globe. Request your catalog or shop online 24 hours a day, seven days a week at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. DX Engineering, thank you so much for your support of Ham Nation. All right, well, let's talk about Newsline. This is normally the time when we bring you the news of the week from Amateur Radio Newsline. Well, I can't produce videos because I'm just not set up to. I lost a radio, computer. Uh, a bunch of stuff. The list is too long to mention, and we've beat that horse to death anyway. Uh, suffice to say, there is no video tonight. Uh, and right now, actually, the, uh, uh, the future of Newsline is more or less in question because our leader and editor and creator and uh, our mentor for the last 37 years, Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF, is back in the hospital. You may have seen this on the QRZ, or not QRZ, but uh, the... Uh, Facebook page for Newsline. He's he's in pretty bad shape, to be uh, quite honest with you. He's got um, some kidney failure and uh, some other problems. Uh, pretty major. He's actually he's in critical condition, so it's, uh, it's pretty bad. So uh, Newsline has been Bill Pasternak, and Bill Pasternak has been Newsline for 37 years. And Skeeter Nash in 5ASH is doing an excellent job of picking up the slack and producing the weekly newscast. Uh, Skeeter has a 12-hour-a-day job. He does a morning show on a radio station, and he's also program director. And I can tell you from experience doing a morning show, that's, that's a full-time deal right there, getting up at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning to be on the radio. And then now that he's program director, he's in charge of the radio station and everything that goes on the radio station, which means he's not, uh, he's not leaving until 5 or 6 in the evening. And then plus trying to do Newsline as well. So we're looking for help, to be quite honest with you. You can go to our, our Facebook page and find the details on this. But if you have a broadcast background, that's very helpful. You don't necessarily have to have a broadcast background. Just be willing to learn a little bit and uh, have uh, you know a little bit of equipment. Chances are, you if you've been watching this show, you probably have a Heil microphone. And maybe you have a mixer and you've built uh, an interface that Bob has showed you how to do that. Well, that pretty much, we've got you set up. If you can, if you can read and write in English and uh, and sound like you know what you're talking about, we could use you. But uh, a broadcast background is definitely helpful, but not necessarily necessary. Go to the Newsline Facebook page, and and you'll see the post on there. And uh, just contact Skeeter Nash, N5ASH. You can look him up on QRZ, N5ASH. And if you'd like to help out and be part of the Newsline team, we would certainly welcome you. Um, I can tell you, tonight, uh, I believe that uh, Christian uh, Kudnick is going to be part of the Newsline team, which we're very excited about that. Christian, of course, uh, you've seen him here with the New Ham segment. Excellent uh, broadcaster, uh, serious broadcaster. So uh, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And, uh, ah, Tamitha Scove just, uh, just messaged me. Uh, we're going to see uh, a video from Tamitha, as a matter of fact. We don't have Newsline, but we do have Tamitha tonight. So, again, if you can help out Newsline, um, either with your talent, or just for support and prayers and positive energy going up for uh, our dear friend, Mr. Pasternak. 
um, we would appreciate any and all. So uh, that's pretty much the state of the Newsline speech tonight. So anyway, let's uh, get on to uh, more positive thoughts. And let's check out the solar update from Dr. Kim Scove. Hi, I'm Tamitha Scove with your solar storm forecast for the week of May 28th. Although the sun has been quiet for quite some time now, we are beginning to see signs of life as several new active regions are going to be rotating into Earth view here in the next day or two. With it have become some beautiful solar storms off the east limb. None of them are Earth directed, but it could continue to bring more of that Earth side as they rotate into the Earth strike zone. Also, we have two solar filaments that are snaking through the Earth strike zone right now, and one of them looks like it's got a little bit of heating going on in that filament channel, which could cause it to go unstable and head towards Earth. On top of that, we also have this huge extended coronal hole that we're expecting to get some fast wind from right about now. Switching to your M-flare threat meter, you can see we've actually been quiet for quite some time now. The last time we had an M-class flare was clear back on the 13th, and we've been quiet for weeks since. Been sitting pretty much below the seafloor, but that may change here pretty soon with these new active regions rotating into view. Returning to the disk, you can see regions 2348 and 2349 are now rotating off of the west limb. And despite the fact that it's grown quite quickly, the region 2353 has not produced any significant flare activity. Now, all the other regions on the disk are quiet right now, but we do have those three new regions that should be numbered today that are rotating onto the east limb, and perhaps they will uh, change the story. So the sun has set the stage for some increased activity this week. We are experiencing some mild effects from that high-speed stream with a kind of a transient disturbance in front of it. But these effects are not expected to impact the amateur radio or GPS operation much at all. But although we might see some aurora at high latitudes. Meanwhile, we do have those new regions that are rotating into view off the east limb, and they are firing off solar storms. So we might get some increased flare activity this week, and as those regions rotate into the Earth strike zone, we might actually see an Earth-directed solar storm. Meanwhile, we are watching two solar filaments that are in the Earth strike zone right now, one of which looks like it might be beginning to go unstable, but most likely these will not erupt until they get to the west limb, and they'll create some gorgeous prominence eruption pictures for us. So we'll be watching closely. I'm Tam of the Scove. Thank you for watching. I hear she just had a wonderful time at Dayton. I saw um, at Dayton. a few pictures with, uh, with her and, and, and Bob, and uh, she just looked like she was having the best time I caught her presentation live on the ICOM website at the Antenna Forum on Dayton Friday. And I'm so glad that uh, we were able to, to get her to Dayton. And thanks to uh, Tim Duffy and DX Engineering for helping make that possible. Wasn't able to go to Dayton, and neither was Amanda, but she's here tonight and watching the chat room. How are you doing, Amanda? I'm doing good. Nice to see you guys. And uh, like that my shirt. Favorite. Do you like it? I love, I love this. It. DX Engineering, Terry and Tim, you guys are awesome. So I think they felt really bad that I didn't get one of the DX Engineering shirts when you guys all got one. And they sent this out with it, isn't it? Oh, I love it. I think I'm going to put my name underneath it, underneath the DX Engineering there, just so no one else can steal it. Um, love it. Thanks, you guys. Pink. It's they my don't favorite. have that in the catalog either. There's no pink in the catalog. I didn't see it. Mm, I think, I think it was special. You got a Anyhow, um, my condolences to Bill Pasternak as well. Bill, we, Jeff and I both here hope that you have a speedy recovery. And Jeff is here in the background. I told him he has to come watch this W0BT segment. That was so awesome. So thanks so much for that, Bob. And with that, Bob, I have another question for you. Um, a lot of times you feature audio that you record while listening to HF or when you make a certain special contact. A lot of us here on Ham Nation would like to know, how do you record your audio? Do you need any special equipment? How does it work? <laughs> you ask, okay? And now you can get surprised as heck and back because this is what I use. Yes, I know the chat room will go stupid on me here. Mini disc. <laughs> I love disc. Why? Because it's so compact and it's better quality than a CD because it doesn't compress as much. But I take a cable. Let's see. I usually keep it right handy. There it is right there. And I take that cable and I plug it in the side of my mini disc and I plug the other side in where? Headphones. Out. Then I plug my headphones 
into the mini disc so I actually can monitor it uh, as it's recorded. That's how I do it. And then from there, I can transfer it to the computer. I can make another mini disc, put it on tape, whatever. Uh, I just, I love doing it because it's easy and it's fast. Uh, I also have a mini disc in the rack down behind me. And I keep it, uh, the output of my mixer console that you see here, all the receivers come up here. That last channel drives that mini disc. And that's always hooked up in it. But a lot of times I don't have it turned on or whatever, and I grab my mini disc. So you asked, that's how I did it. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, mini disc, you can buy them on eBay for 40 bucks, and they're just great. I find that really interesting. There's a lot of times I would have liked to have recorded audio. Instead, I have to rely on the man here to just take out a smartphone and record. And then there's video and stuff. I'd rather just have the audio, but I appreciate what he does as well. Thanks, Jeff. Um, thanks, Bob, for that. And one more thing. I think a lot of people were going crazy seeing that you had some Heil flags at some field day sites. Is there any way we can get our hands on some? Yeah, so all you have to do is uh, call the plant, look up on our website, and uh, call, and uh, they can help you. Be glad to. I, uh, uh, I thought I had one laying down here, but, oh, they're over there. I got black ones and white ones. Uh, most of them are black today with white on them. Yeah, just call the uh, Heil plant back in Illinois, and they will be glad to help you. That'd be cool. That would be awesome. I'm, I'm really looking forward to displaying one with our American flag this year. So thank you so much for that. And uh, Brian, did we get George back on the line? Hello. Well, hello. Thanks, <laughs> George. I just, uh, we had Jeff and I here. We're curious. How Have you checked out um, the $9 the chip that's coming out? And if so, do you plan on uh, doing any um, work with it? Um. Uh... Well, you kind of caught me off guard because Brian had disconnected me, and I had disconnected my webcam, so we kind of got it back here. But, no, I'm not sure what you're talking about, the $9 chip. Uh, more information on that? So, evidently, it is, um, and they display it with a banana as part of the logo, and it's a $9 microchip computer that's going to be coming out here soon. And I, I think it's maybe a Kickstarter at this point in time, but I figured you would be right on it. Just wondering if you had heard about it, but I guess not. So if you're going to you have to uh, research it. If you don't mind me jumping in real quick, we actually, Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> I'll explain it to you real quick, George. Um, last week on Saturday on the screensavers, we had a company come in and they they had a Kickstarter for something called chip. And yeah, it's the world's first $9 computer. Um, they wanted, I think their goal was, yeah, $50,000. They've, very getting very close to two million dollars now. Wow. Um, so it's kind of like a Raspberry Pi, but um, a bit more modular. Uh, so you can do a bunch of different projects and stuff with it. But it, these are the components, you know, a uh, one gigahertz processor, 512 megabytes of RAM, um, four gigabytes of storage, and it comes integrated with Wi Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, so definitely in the same vein as the Raspberry Pi, but they want to do some uh, cool open software stuff with it. And one of the, the neat things that they showed off was kind of like a Game Boy emulator with a keyboard. Mm -hmm. So that's one of their projects they're doing. So if you want to find out more information, you can definitely check out their Kickstarter. Just search uh, $9 computer and uh, or also go back to Saturday's episode, episode four of the Screensavers and check it out. I think it's yeah. definitely a project you want to look at yeah i think i'll have to look at that uh boy I, yeah i'll have to check that out for sure nine dollars and two million dollars you know i think i'm oh, gonna you know i think i'm eight dollar and fifty cent computer <laughs> 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 well the, the cool thing about the interview on uh on saturday is they kind of explained the the process behind getting all the parts and why you know, why they wanted to make a $9 computer and why they needed Kickstarter's help to do that to get, you know, all the parts together. Because you have to buy, like, if you buy it all in bulk, you can reduce prices and all sorts of cool stuff. So it's definitely it, a project that me and Padre are definitely going to play with. So Yeah, definitely worth looking at. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, George, for coming back on to um, uh, take you by surprise. I appreciate that a lot. Um, that's my job, though, I think. And... Uh, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Don, I do have just one more question for you. Um, there's been kind of some dispute because ARRL has listed on their website that the Young Ham of the Year Award is the nominations are due by May 30th and the Young Ham of the Year Award application actually has June 30th as the deadline date. Do you think you could clarify that for us? My guess would be it's a typo. Um, uh, if, if we're saying May 30th uh, on the website and May 30th in the uh, in the newscast when they when they get produced, I would I would stick with May 30th. Um, that's that's what I've heard. I have not had time to go on to the Newsline website and look at the the Young Ham of the Year page, but I know that in years past, it's I believe it's usually been the end of May has been when the cutoff is because, of course, you know we have to vet all of the. Uh, uh, all of the applicants or the nominees and uh, get everything together because, uh, you know, we're less than three months away from the Huntsville Ham Fest. The Huntsville Ham Fest is, a, is the third weekend in August. It's exactly three months after Dayton. So uh, the end of May is about how long you need to go through and, and look at all the applicants and go through their packages. Some of the packages are quite comprehensive and uh, vet them and, uh, and narrow it down and, and, and pick a winner, uh, a recipient. It's more than just being a winner, of course. But uh, I would stick with with what um, we've been saying for uh, for all of this year since nominations opened, and that was May thirtieth. I would stick with that. Okay, that that sounds good. It makes me a little nervous because I have a job to do here. But I did read the application said June thirtieth, so I thought I had a little bit more time to nominate a fellow. So okay, thank you so I will, much. I will attempt to find out. I will. Um, I'll tell you what I'll do is, is tonight. I will email the um, uh, 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 Mark Abramovich, NT3V, who is the uh, the head of the, uh, of the selection committee, and I will find out, and uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll do something on the Newsline uh, Facebook page. If you're not a member of the Newsline Facebook page, I I certainly uh, uh, implore you to go and do that. So that's well, I'll find out and I'll post something on the Newsline Facebook page uh, tonight or tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. The, the deadline's coming close and if it's May 30th, but thanks Dylan for uh, letting me know absolutely nothing. I appreciate that. Um, no, I'm kidding. Anyhow. Hey, you guys, it's been a great night and I've had some wonderful questions and um, just glad to be here tonight. So uh, let's send it back to you, Bob. Hey, uh, I, I, I forgot to mention and somebody in the chat room did. Yes. I love Real to real. I don't do a lot of recording on it anymore. I did years ago, and I have tons of tape. I mean, probably a couple of hundred reels, and I slowly have been digitizing some of them so I can find them better. But nothing like analog stuff. <laughs> oh, golly. Well, it's been wonderful. I thank everybody for being here. Gordo had to slip out because he's teaching a class, and... Uh, Don, we're so happy that you're back on the air. It, it just, it was such a disaster to lose all that equipment. But I, I hope that you're going to get uh, get things back in order. At least you're here for us, so that's good. Yeah, and you'll, uh, we're, take we're care trying. Of we're trying. Wait yeah. on a wait on a check and start buying stuff. And by the way, um, Ray Novak in nine JA just jumped in uh, into the chat room, and he says he just looked on the AWR web web page, and the ARRL web page says. May 30th for the Young Ham of the Year uh, award deadline. So let's go with May 30th. Okay, that's uh, okay. what we'll do. Thank Thanks, you. Ray. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're so happy that things are going there for you, Don. You and Don uh, are going to have uh, things to rebuild. And uh, what can we say about Bill Pasternak? It's just prayers. It's all we can do at this time. And uh, we're just praying that he will continue to get better and I, I just gosh we go back to the 50s together when we met first met on six meters and oh boy George will uh, be looking for another uh, rendition of the old smoke and solder and uh, I guess you'll be on the air tonight somewhere so I'll hook, uh, hook up with you and um, I guess that's about it thanks very much uh, Brian for a nice uh, job done there and uh, We'll see you all in just a little bit over here on eh, 40 or 75 or maybe 20. It just depends on what's open. But uh, join us all and remember to find the the special event stations. Uh, that's going to be fun to work those guys and gals and get your certificates and all that. 
So we will see you next week right here at the same old place. And uh, we'll uh, continue on our discussion of this great hobby called amateur radio. Bye-bye for now from K9EID in the Ozarks. <laughs>